I'm Rob Lucuri, your senior editor at Gold Derby, and I'm here with the creme de la creme of showrunners on TV this year. I'm so excited to introduce you all to, of course, the one and only Chuck Lorre, Jonathan Tollins, Lulu Wang, Meredith Scardino, John Hoffman, and Michael Jonathan Smith. What a group. I am so Ooh. fortunate to have you all with us. Let's talk showrunning, everybody. That's what I really want to get to the, to the nitty gritty of showrunning. And the, my first question, and I'm going to go straight to Chuck Lorre first. My first question is this. Steve Jobs once said, there's a tremendous amount of craftsmanship between a great idea and a great product. There's so much that happens between the idea and the end and the end product. So that's good show running, isn't it? Good show running is being a problem solver and as being someone who collaborates and hones the product until the very last second and it never, ever stops. Would you agree? Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> I don't know. You said really well. It is problem solving. It's a, it's a endless series of problem solving uh, moments. And um, yeah, and, uh, and, and when it's uh, when these problems get solved effectively, it's a lot of fun. Um, when they mount up and uh, there's no way out, um, it's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. And, you know, Jonathan, um, the great Robert King, who I think you might know, um, did recently tweet that uh, it's a really excellent description of show running because you're always running up against this deadline and revising constantly with your collaborators. W what do you think, Jonathan? Is that a pretty accurate description of what your day-to-day -day life is? I, this is my first time doing it. And um, when I finally started to feel comfortable is when I realized that you just have to give in to the process and not try to think about what you're doing. The closest you can come to with a feeling of when you're writing, which is sort of listening to a voice in your head of whether something feels right or wrong. And you just have to make constant decisions based on that little voice in your head and just know that there is no right or wrong. It's just you're the person in the chair this time. And so you have to follow that sense of what feels right to you. And then, you know, and if you're if you're friendly and make your decisions fast, people trust you and you hope for the best. That sounds kind of terrifying, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what do you think now? There's going to be uh, John and Jonathan. So John Hoffman, what do you think about this whole quandary about good show running? Is there such a thing? And what do you think it is? Yeah. Oh, God. Well, um, I mean, I agree with what these two esteemed gentlemen have just said tremendously, but I, I do think, I don't know. I, 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 this is my first time doing it as well. And, and I think I, but I've been around it a little bit. So I do think um, you, you are reliant fully as the, per I like being the person who makes the decisions. Um, and because I, I think there's no one sort of closer to the way in which it, the story should be told. So I like that feeling of no no i i should be the one who says that although it doesn't re reduce the horror of panic when you don't really know the answer um <laughs> i always find good show running in my mind is when you can admit that truthfully and, <laughs> and own that and say okay you know what i don't know the answer to that and it's always kind of exciting when that happens in some ways because then you are reliant on on other people and great artists to sort of like help you through but I do like the, I think if you have something that is of cohesive vision, that it that it is incumbent upon you in this position to really um, own that and um, really be a guide for everybody else. And, and that's the job. And so I always look at it like, just let everyone sort of be able to do their best work mm -hmm. And the ticket to that is giving them the best guidance for the narrative you're telling and, and how in, in tone and sensibility you can convey that to people. Mm -hmm. And and that goes across the board through every decision I've found that I've had to make in this process. Yeah. So Meredith, if you think about it, picking up on what John just said, if you're the smartest in the room, should you find another room? Like, that's really what we're saying. Don't be the smartest person. <laughs> <laughs> I like to, yes, yeah. I, I do like to surround myself with geniuses to yeah. kind of like, you know, just be a sponge and absorb what, what they uh, are bringing to the table. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I also think it's, yeah, speaking of that, like I 
been very fortunate to to learn from Tina Fey and Robert Carlock, uh, uh, you know, who are also uh, producers with me on Girls Five Eva, which is like as a first time showrunner, it's nice to be able to kind of like whenever you are drowning a little bit, be like, get a bounce from them. Hey, what do you think about this? Hey, what do you think about that? Um, it's always nice to have somebody to go to, but I, you know, I agree if you trust your departments, if you, you know, everybody, you know, I had like such an amazing crew and everybody was a problem solver. I, I also think that everybody who's made a show during COVID is like, are some of the best problem solvers going uh, because every day I always felt like our call sheets were a suggestion <laughs> uh, you know what I mean uh, at a certain point so I just think that we yeah. e everybody's just ready to be like oh no we can't shoot that today we got to go shoot this or you know get this costume out or you know find the truck whatever uh, so I think um, and and TV people are just generally like wonderful problem solvers so I think uh when it works well, it works great. Um, uh, wow. <laughs> so speaking of COVID, Lulu, uh, uh, expats, you, not only were you during the pandemic, but you're filming in Hong Kong and in LA. So what for you after that experience, what is good show running? Have you figured it out? Uh, gosh, you know, first of all, I have to say I have so much respect for everybody in this room uh, because <laughs> I didn't really know what show running was coming from indie filmmaking. And then everything you guys have said, the problem solving, you know, putting people, relying on your crew. I mean, that's what we did. We had no idea what was ahead of us, even though it was this huge production and it was my first time show running, first time working on something of this size. In many ways, it doesn't feel that different from an indie film, particularly during COVID where we were out there alone and like, just bring it back, finished and on budget, like, <laughs> oh. And so um, I would say, yeah, just relying on people, like the crew around us. And, and as Meredith said, like every day, you know, anything can change at any moment and you have to be ready to pivot. Um, and shooting in a foreign country where locking locations is not the most easy thing because it's not um, a, like a common, they, they, they don't support a lot of productions. And so it was really impossible to even get locations and then having to pivot. So um, all of that is, uh, is, is incredible. And I don't know how you all do it season after season. Yeah. It's crazy. And then I was thinking, like, for example, um, Jonathan, you know, back in the day, The Good Wife was like 22 episodes a season. Now we we have shows where things are much tighter and you might have seven, eight, nine, ten at the max, I would, I would say. It's a very different proposition, Jonathan. But then I was then wondering, OK, so you still only have, say, 10 episodes, but you must have moments where it's a complete nightmare. Something's hit you really hard. And so I'm wondering, what is a showrunner's worst nightmare and what keeps you up at night? The, the Well, I mean, well, we only did, we did nine new episodes this year because of the strike, but we're about yeah. to go into a full season. Um, really? A real old fashioned, and I've only done that once as a producer. I was on the first season of Queer as Folk uh, a generation ago. Uh, we, we did, I think we did 23 and it's a lot. Wow. But the, the, you know, the biggest nightmare is things having to be thrown out at the last minute or someone's mm -hmm. the network saying, and they, they haven't, but saying, you know, that this story doesn't work or we can't get a guest star. I mean, that's, that's the thing where you just feel like you're up against it and you just don't know how you can possibly do it. I mean, you know, I've worked, I've worked on shows where they've had the luxury where we did, we wrote the entire season before production where the job is hard is when you're writing and you're in production at the same time and you just never feel like there are enough hours in the day. Um, but it's also, I, you know, it's really fun. I mean, it's a, it's an incredible opportunity. And, and if people like the show, it's like, my God, I hope this lasts. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, I mean, let's put it into context. I mean, it's a first world problem, of course. Yeah. And, and you wouldn't be doing, none of you would be doing this if you didn't um, find enjoyment out of it, but surely there has to be moments where uh, Chuck, for example, like, you know, you're on currently, I think, in season two of Bookie, and you've been doing this for a very long time. And do you still have moments where something will happen on set or something will happen during production that just keeps you up at night? 
Um, you mean the uh, the, the darkness? Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, I, I actually, I, I, what my experience has been on Bookie has just been uh, it's it's been a blast. I, you know, uh, I, I've got this extraordinary cast. Um, it's a real deep, deep cast, and um, and uh, we're having a lot of fun. Is occasionally, you know, that I, I, I'm coming from four cameras and an audience. I'm used to a table read, a rehearsal, another rehearsal, camera blocking, and then uh, you know a dirty run through, and then putting it in front of an audience. I have I'm 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 so acclimated to participating in the production for several days before it ever is committed to film or tape or whatever, and um, and I take that I I can't that's that's kind of in my DNA now, so I'm on the set whatever or the location all the time on bookie and i i did the same thing with the kaminsky method i i uh, without those rehearsals um i don't know how you can polish material i don't know how you can spot problems uh unless you're there yeah. um yeah. and I, I i my nightmare is uh being in, in an editing bay and, and watching something that doesn't work and going oh now what am I supposed to do? Um, do I get to reshoot? I, that's the nightmare. So I, by being on set, being on the location, and watching something not work, and then fixing it, doing whatever we can to either fix it or cut it or something, but not just shoot it because we wrote it. You know, I, you know. I don't know how any other way to say it, but every script that I I write or I, I co-write or whatever, it's about 30% of it that sucks. <laughs> it's just wrong. And I can't see it. And I, and you know, the nightmare is I can't see it until it's on its feet. And then, and then it's, it's vividly wrong. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so for, for me, the, 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 uh, the secret, the magic is in, in having the opportunity to fix it. You know, uh, and not and not and not shoot it just because you wrote it. Shoot it because it's good, and 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 don't be sitting in an editing bay going, Jesus, <laughs> this is, what have we done? Uh, wow, that's a, that's a really interesting insight. I never really thought of it that way, but you are constantly honing it and chiseling it down to to what is the closest thing in your mind to perfection throughout the whole process. Would that that's pretty much accurate, isn't it, Michael? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, uh, you're constantly rewriting, you're constantly changing, you're constantly, especially like for, for the show I work on, um, it's a very VFX heavy show. So you're yeah. constantly like, oh, that stunt didn't work. So how do we fix it with the the shots that we do have? And how do you tape it together and try to get wow. a cohesive, you know, in post? And so much of it is, you know, like we had a car. I mean, you know, you should add cars to that thing of like, don't work with children and pets. <laughs> because cars are just like a pain in the ass. But, uh, but you know, we had a car that straight up did not work at the day we were supposed to shoot it. So we had to make it completely digital on the day uh, and shoot everything around how the car was gonna be imagined and what the shots were gonna be. And it was gonna be chased by a missile and all that. So, so much of it is you're writing it and then you're shooting it and rewriting it on the day you're shooting it. And then in post you're rewriting it when that doesn't work and when the notes come in. And so you're just constantly, constantly, I think chiseling it is the perfect way to put it. You're chiseling it and it's never, what is that phrase? Um, great art is never finished, only abandoned. And I feel like that's, yeah. that's the biggest thing. It's like, how close can you get it to what you have in your head? It's so true. Meredith, do you agree? Cause I, whenever I speak to, for example, directors, they, they sometimes will say to me, look, I never really think that I have the perfect shot or the perfect scene, but eventually you just have to move on. Um, but you want to get as close as to yeah. perfection as possible. So what do you think about that well, whole quandary? I completely agree that there is no such thing as finished. It's just, for me, I, I was, I've, I haven't heard like it's art is abandoned. It's like, it's like time is up. I just run out of time. <laughs> and, you know, I, I often fill the vessel I have, like if I had, someone gave me a month to write a haiku it would be you know right up to the deadline I would be changing it because I, it's just not there's just not it's not possible for me to be like oh yeah it's completely done um, but then there is a there is a sense by the time that you keep you know 
you know, after script and, and shooting and, and when you're in edit and then adding score and, and, and by the time you're in that process, you're like, oh, this, this is what it was meant to be. And it feels inevitable in a way. Um, and, and that's exciting and it does feel complete, but, but it, at, at the same time, time is up. <laughs> so think, uh, Leonard, <laughs> Leonard Bernstein, I think said uh, that to produce great things, all you need is a plan and not quite enough time. I mean, we're talking about time, like just to just to say to what's the, the the positive of not having enough time is I think limitations bring out creativity. Like yeah. the second you're right. limited with time or actors or this, you have to problem solve and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. And I think that is part of the fun. It's like, okay, you're limited. How do you make a show with these five things so that you that you know yes. you have or whatever? You know what I mean? Yeah. I know what I, I was gonna say. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. deadlines. I love deadlines. Having to, do, having to do having to do a murder mystery. Yeah. 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 I think also I just to say, as Lulu was saying, I was so I was so excited to see all of you. You're also making me want to pass out because everyone is like bringing up the problems. I'm I'm just in the last block of season four in the middle of everything, and every single box has brought up a problem that I've had to deal with in the last three days. And I'm like, uh, I'm not, but I'm deep in the middle of it right now. So it's, it's palpable when you're in, when you're in it, but it's also exciting. As you were saying, I think it's that thing of, um, there's a lot that's, you know, as much as you try and plan, as much as you try and get it together and, and like be there and, 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 and all the factors that go into what, what are we shooting right now today and making sure as Chuck was saying that, that sort of like problem free or when there's problems, you can fix them right there while you have that moment. But it's also as much as you do, it, it, it's really, you know, there are still those moments later that come and you're just going, oh, okay, a new round of storytelling <laughs> as you get into post and as you get into sort of shaping each episode and everything. And there is real joy in that, but it's also um, when 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 it's first posed, it's panic making for sure. Wow. Lulu, you get the final word. You you work you're working in, with a cast with this unknown Nicole Kidman. It's kind of like what John has with these two unknown comedians. But yeah. um, you're yeah, yeah, chiseling and chiseling and chiseling. But talk me through that nightmare scenario. Do you, did you have many of those on expats? Uh, I think we had all of them. Is what <laughs> I was told by the studio. Um, they would say like, you know, you really got thrown every single challenge. We've never seen a show like this before. Um, of course, I have no comparison, so uh, I just had to deal with it each, like you know, moment to moment. Um, and of course, just having you know, we had six languages in the show, so we're flying people from all across the world, um, actors with different levels of experience, like someone like Nicole, but then we have non actors who've never acted a day in their life before being on screen next to Nicole. So it was definitely a lot to balance. And I think that the challenges were also privileges, right? Because I've never done something that took so long. And so to yeah. um, the stamina of it, and I directed all of the episodes as well. And so I was on set for, you know, the six and a half hour thing. Um, and so the stamina was really hard and the continuity to like to and the schedule was constantly changing. And so today we we thought we were going to shoot from episode two, but actually we lost our location, you know, for whatever reason. And so we're going to switch gears and go to episode six. And you have to tell your actor, like, we're switching gears. And um, sorry that you don't have that script memorized, but here we go. Um, so that was just, and then like, you know, the scene that we was previous to this, we shot six months ago. So can we get back into that? moment moment that we have no idea so it was a lot of that but the great thing too is you guys are talking about chiseling which you know I've never had this experience is that if there is a problem and I see it in the edit I can go well what what haven't we shot yet that we could fix like we can't fix what we've already shot but there's so many opportunities can we like set it up differently so it makes this moment play better like what are we missing so like Yes, the rewriting can be hard, but it also is such a great opportunity to keep making it better and better. And you, you do have a longer period of time as opposed to like a film, you shoot for 26 days and then this is what you have and that's it. Wow. 
Um, and yet, see, we hear about the sausage being made behind the curtain, so to speak, and then we get to watch these amazing shows on TV and we're none the wiser. It's like as if you just clicked your fingers and it was all just put out for the audience. <laughs> on that note, everybody, thank you so much for your insight today on this panel and congratulations to all of you on some really impressive work this season. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks so much.